torchbearers of history, a connected series of historical sketches by Amelia Hutchinson Stone. Chapter 7 Robert Bruce, The Independence of Scotland While Dante was wandering about, an exile from his native city, two countries of Europe, both of them lands of the mountains and the flood, were making a glorious struggle for their freedom against tyranny and oppression of a much stronger power. These countries were Switzerland and Scotland. The struggle against tyranny had already been begun in modern Europe, as we have seen by the first free cities of Italy, and it was carried on later in England, where the subjects of the tyrant King John, the brother of Richard Coeur de Lyon, forced him to acknowledge their rights by signing Magna Carta. But I think it was in the mountain passes of Switzerland and among the wilds and wastes of Scotland that the noblest, bravest fights were fought for freedom. Of the struggle in Switzerland I cannot tell you here much, though I should have liked to tell you the story of Tell, the great hero of the Swiss, and of the three brave men with their thirty followers who met by night in a dark, deep valley, and swore an oath to free their country from the tyrant, and of the glorious battle that was fought and won by the band of Swiss peasants against the trained army of the Emperor of Germany, the Battle of Morgarten, the Marathon of Switzerland, as it has been called. But I think it will be better to tell you more particularly how the people of Scotland fought for and won their independence. For centuries the Scottish people had been governed by their own kings. During the twelfth century, their king, William the Lion, had been taken prisoner by the king of England, Henry the Second, and had only been set free after swearing allegiance to Henry. But, as we have seen, he was afterwards freed from his oath of allegiance by Richard Coeur de Lyon, in return for a large sum of money. A century later, however, Scotland again came into the hands of the English king. This king was Edward I, the grand-nephew of Richard Coeur de Lyon, and perhaps the greatest of all the Norman kings who had yet ruled in England. He had all the strength and courage of his great-uncle Richard, and like him he fought as a crusader in the Holy Land. But he was a much wiser and abler statesman and general than Richard. Now, while Edward I was reigning in England, the King of Scotland died, leaving no children. Two noblemen claimed the Scottish throne, John Balliol and Robert Bruce. And as the Scottish people could not decide themselves who had better right to be king, they asked Edward to settle the dispute. Edward was willing enough to do so, but he demanded that he should be acknowledged as Lord Paramount over Scotland. This was granted, and then Edward marched into Scotland with a large army, and took possession of all the strongest castles. When the claims of the Scottish throne of the two nobles were brought before him, he decided in favour of John Balliol, who was therefore crowned king, but was given to understand that he was only a vassal or subject of England. The Scottish nobles, however, could not bear the humiliating position of being subject to England, and they entered into a treaty with the King of France against Edward. Edward got together a large army, and having entered Scotland, carried everything before him. John Balliol appeared before him and humbly asked for pardon, which was granted only on condition of the crown of Scotland, being resigned into Edward's hand. Edward then sent the crown with the scepter and the stone chair of which the ancient kings of Scotland had been crowned to Westminster Abbey, and he forced the chief Scottish nobles to swear allegiance to him. Thus Scotland became part of Edward's kingdom. But the Scots would not submit to English rule. No sooner was Edward out of the country than they rose in rebellion and attacked the English garrisons, which he had left in the castles. At first they could not venture on any open attack on the English, but at length they found an able leader in Sir William Wallace, a Scottish hero 
no less celebrated than Robert Bruce. Under the leadership of this brave man, they gradually increased in their strength and daring. And at last, they were able to meet and overcome the English forces at Stirling. I cannot tell you here all the brave deeds of Wallace, all that he did and all that he tried to do for Scotland, as it is a portrait of Bruce that I am to give you now. In the end, after all his glorious struggles for freedom of his country, he fell into the hands of the English by treachery of Scotsmen, and was put to death as a traitor in 1305. It was after the death of Wallace that Bruce came to the front in Scotland. He was the son of Earl of Carrick, and his grandson of Balliol's rival for the Scottish throne. As a young man, he did not show great strength of character and decision of purpose that afterwards appeared in him. We hear of him at one time siding with Wallace and at another time swearing allegiance to Edward. But after the death of Wallace, when the hearts of all true Scotsmen were full of indignation against his destroyer, Edward of England, Bruce seems to have thought that the time had come to take possession of the throne, which by right belonged to him, and to free his country from the English conquerors. At that time, Balliol was in prison, and the only other claimant to the Scottish crown, besides Bruce himself, was the Earl of baden Noch, generally called the Red Comyn. Bruce offered to give this man the estates which he had inherited from his father, in return for which Comyn was to help Bruce to gain possession of the throne. Comyn consented to the proposal. But Bruce afterwards discovered that he had told the English king what had been arranged, and had advised him to put Bruce to death. Indignant at his treachery, Bruce hastened to Dumfries, where Comyn was staying, and a meeting took place between the two in a chapel belonging to the convent of the Minorite friars. Bruce, with fierce anger and indignation, accused Comyn of treachery. Comyn retorted angrily, You lie! Overwrought with excitement at the discovery he had made, and with fatigue from his long, rapid journey, for he was in London when he first heard of Comyn's treachery. Bruce could not restrain himself when he heard these words. A sudden fury seized him, and before he knew what he was doing, he had drawn his dagger, and the red Comyn was lying bathed in a pool of blood at his feet. I think he was horror-struck, at what he had done almost as soon as he had done it. When he appeared at the porch of the church, where a few of his friends were waiting for him, he was pale and scared and haggard-looking. I doubt I have slain the Coleman, he said in a shamed, awkward-stricken tone, when his friends, alarmed at his appearance, asked what the matter was. You doubt it, replied Kilpatrick. Well, if you doubt it, I'll make succour, I'll make sure. And he entered the church, and killed the Comyn, who was lying wounded on the steps of the altar. The story of the murder of Comyn had left a terrible blot on the character of Bruce. I have told it to you, because I must try to give you a true portrait as possible, and it would not be true if I were to tell you only what is good, and nothing that is bad. After this you can imagine what a very dangerous position Bruce was in, and how nearly everyone was against him. All the friends and relatives of Comyn, and he had belonged to a large and powerful family, were his deadly enemies. All clergymen and church people were deeply indignant against him for having profaned the church by committing a murder in it, and Edward I was of course furious at being openly defied. There was nothing left for Bruce to do but to try and gather a few brave followers round him, and fight his way to freedom and the throne of Scotland. That was what he did. In March 1306, surrounded by a small band of Scottish nobles, he was crowned at Scone, near Perth, by the Countess of Fife, she taking the place of her husband, who, according to the custom, ought to have performed the ceremony, but who was then on the side of Edward, while a little golden circlet, taken from the image of some saint, took the place of the Scottish crown, then in Westminster. 
When Edward heard what had taken place in Scotland, he took a solemn oath to march into the country and punish the Scots for what he called their treachery, and he got together a large army, and accompanied by his son, afterwards Edward the Second, he immediately began his march. Meantime, Bruce and his few followers were suffering the greatest hardships, outcasts and exiles, with neither home nor country. They wandered about the wilds of Perthshire, accompanied by their wives and sisters who, like their husbands and brothers, had no place of safety where they could take shelter. Often they had nothing to eat but the roots and wild berries which they could gather. At other times they would perhaps catch some fish or game. It is curious to think that while the Italian Dante was learning in exile how bitter was the bread of the stranger, in Scotland Bruce was forgetting the taste of bread altogether. During this time, Bruce often amazed his companions by his wonderful strength and courage, and there are stories told of his feats of daring, which I have not the space to tell you here, nor was it only by his courage in fight that he surprised and delighted his followers. He showed equal courage and strength in endurance, often when they were worn out and dejected, with want and fatigue and suffering, he would cheer and inspirit them by telling them stirring tales which he had read of brave knights who had gone through great hardships and trials, but had conquered in the end. The first winter after his coronation, Bruce and his followers spent in Ireland. After having sent their wives and sisters under the escort of Bruce's younger brother Nigel to kill Drummy, the castle was stormed by the English who hanged the brave young Nigel and threw the women into prison. In the following spring, Bruce and his companions landed on the coast of Carrick, his family estate, attacked the village of Turnbury at night, killed the English soldiers who were quartered there, and carried off several horses and a quantity of silver plate, which afterwards helped to buy him soldiers. This was the first stroke of luck that Bruce had yet had, but his troubles were by no means over. Two of his brothers, who had been gathering an army for him in Ireland, were taken by the English and brought before Edward, who instantly had them put to death. Bruce and his few followers were again obliged to wander about in concealment, this time in Carrick, pursued by the enemy, and many were the hair-breath escapes of the exiled king and his friends from the hands of their enemy and many were the wonderful adventures they experienced, adventures as romantic as those of any knight errand of fiction. One night, when Bruce and a few wearied followers had got separated from the rest of his men, they suddenly heard, through the darkness, the deep bark of a bloodhound. They listened, and they heard it again and again, each time sounding nearer than the time before. Then they knew that the enemy were on their track, and they would soon overtake them. Bruce at once sent two men to bring up the rest of his followers. The others who were with him he posted behind a small stream, while he himself took his place alone at the ford, which only one man could cross at a time. Silently he waited in the darkness, a solitary, motionless, massive figure, prepared to meet whatever was in store for him. Louder and louder became the yells of the bloodhound, nearer and nearer came the enemy, two hundred men strong. Soon the first man plunged with a splash into the stream, but he never reached the other side. Bruce's spear pierced his body, and it fell lifeless into the water. So it befell, the second and the third, and even the fourth. Then Bruce's followers came up, and by their sudden onset, and their shouts frightened the enemy and put them to flight. That is only one of the many wonderful feats of strength and courage performed by Bruce. I should like to tell you of others, but I must go on to relate the more important events of his life. After more than a year of life of a mere outcast, who was hunted like a wild beast, he had managed to gather round him more followers, and when the English believed that he was dead, or his little band dispersed, he made two sudden attacks on their outposts. In 1307, 
he was able to meet the Earl of Pembroke in open battle at Loudon Hill, when the English were totally defeated. Shortly after this battle, the best event took place that could have happened for the cause of Bruce. The brave, able Edward I died on his march, almost within sight of Scotland, after making his son and his chief baron swear that they would carry his bones before them into Scotland, and keep them unburied until the country should be conquered. I cannot tell you here of all the successes gained by Bruce, while Edward II, forgetful of his oath to his father, was enjoying himself in London. In 1310, the English king did indeed lead three invading armies into Scotland, but they effected nothing as the Scots simply laid waste the country before them, and then retreated northwards, leaving the English to advance if they liked into a country where there was nothing for them to eat. At last, all the strong castles in Scotland, which had been taken by Edward I, were in the hands of Bruce, except the castle of Stirling, which the English governor had promised to give up to the Scots at midsummer of the year 1314. If the English armory did not come to its help before that time, before the day fixed on for the surrender of the castle, Edward II had assembled an enormous army and was advancing towards Stirling. But Bruce was prepared for him. When, on the 23rd of June, the English arrived within sight of Stirling, they found the small Scottish army drawn up in readiness for the battle on the field of Bannockburn. I could fill pages if I were to attempt to describe you the fight that took place the following day, or to tell you one half of the stories in connection with it that are cherished in the proud hearts of the Scots, and how carefully and prudently Bruce had made his preparations for the battle, how the Scots spent the night before the fight in prayer and watching, while the English feasted and reveled, how nobly Edward Bruce, the brother of the king, and the young Randolph, his nephew, with the good Sir James Douglas, and the other of the Scottish nobles, bore themselves in the fight. How the English cavalry were powerless against the close-formed squares of the Scottish foot, and how the flower of the English archers went down before the impetuous charge of Bruce's small body of horse. After the battle, when the English king and the remains of his army were fleeing from the country, Thirty thousand English were found dead on the field, and the prisoners were so many that their ransoms made Scotland rich in one day. We are told that the loss of this battle was such a blow to English pride that afterwards a hundred English would not be ashamed to flee from four Scottish soldiers. The next thirteen or fourteen years of Bruce's life are still the story of fights and conquests on the part of the Scots, for the English had not yet acknowledged their independence. At length, in 1328, when Edward II had died, his son Edward III was still a boy of some fourteen or fifteen years. A peace was concluded between the two countries, and the freedom of Scotland was acknowledged by the English. After that, Bruce, who was now worn out and feeble in body from the hardships he had undergone, retired to his palace of Codros where he led a quiet, peaceful life, employing his leisure time in improving his grounds and gardens, followed by his pet, a tame lion. Here he died in 1329. Before he died, he gave a last charge to his faithful follower, Sir James Douglas, which the other with sobs promised to fulfil. It had been a dream of Bruce's that when his country should be at peace, he would go to Palestine, to fight against the Mohammedans. Now he had to give up this dream. But he begged his trusty friend and follower that when he was no more, Douglas would take his heart to the Holy Land and bury it there. When Sir James gave his promise, Bruce thanked him. For now, he said, I shall die more in ease of mind, since I know that most my worthy and sufficient knight of my realm shall achieve for me that which I could never attain unto. So in the following spring, Douglas set out to fulfill his promise to the king, carrying with him the heart of the Bruce, enclosed in a casket of silver. <laughs>
but he never reached Palestine. When he was in Holland, on his way there, he heard that the Christian king of Castile in Spain was at war with the Moorish sultan of Granada, and thinking that this would be a noble cause in which to fight, he made his way to the south of Spain, where the war was going on. While pursuing the Moors in battle, he and his followers got separated from the Christian army and found themselves surrounded by the Moorish army. Taking the silver casket from his neck, to which he wore it fastened, he flung it into the midst of the enemy, exclaiming, Forward, brave heart, as thou weren't wont, Douglas will follow thee or die. Then he dashed into the thickest of the enemy ranks and fell covered with wounds. The next day he was found lying dead on the field beside the heart of his master, which he had reached through the midst of the foe. Thus perished one of Scotland's bravest heroes.